This is Duke University. Well, welcome, everyone. Welcome. My name is Matt Nash, and I'm the executive director of CASE. For those of you who might not be aware, CASE is the Center for the Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship. And we're a research and education center here at the Fuqua School of Business focused on promoting the entrepreneurial pursuit of social impact. And since we're based in a business school, we're especially interested in looking at how um, business expertise can be thoughtfully applied to addressing critical social needs. Um, I'd particularly like to extend a warm welcome to folks who are joining us tonight from outside Fuqua, elsewhere around the campus, around the Durham community. Thrilled you made the trek out to uh, find us, navigate your way through this school, which sometimes feels like a bit of a maze. And I promise you there's not a big chunk of cheese somewhere at the end of it, but I, I'm thrilled you found us and you found the Janine Auditorium. Uh, I will mention that um, we do have events and speakers throughout the year that are open to the public. Uh, some examples of those coming up uh, on, we have on Wednesday, February 9th, our Net Impact Club has their annual conference on sustainable business and um, social impact, and we're welcome to join us on, on Wednesday, February 9th. Uh, also, in the end of February, we'll be hosting a national conference on social entrepreneurship education in partnership with Ashoka, which is the global network of leading social entrepreneurs. And so on February 25th through 27th, we'll have the Ashoka U Exchange, and on the night of Friday the 25th, we'll have a TEDx event, a very interactive session highlighting some of the leading social entrepreneurs from around the world uh, here on Friday the 25th. So you can look at the case at duke.org website for more information on that. You know, in particular, I'm thrilled to welcome you tonight because this is an annual celebration that we host. Um, and each year, we select someone to receive the Case Leadership in Social Entrepreneurship Award. And this is the, actually the eighth time we've made this presentation, and I know that we're all in for a special treat tonight. Um, what we try to do is we try to seek to recognize someone can be a social entrepreneur, <coughs> uh, a, a thoughtful uh, observer, an author, someone who's made significant contributions to the field of social entrepreneurship. So not only just contributions to you know, achieving social impact through a particular organization, though many of our award winners have done that, but these are also leaders who really significantly advance um, the practice of social entrepreneurship or the study and understanding of social entrepreneurship uh, around the world. So for example, past recipients have included uh, Jacqueline Novogratz, the founder of the Acumen Fund, David Bornstein, author, Bill Drayton, founder of Ashoka, Wendy Kopp of Teach for America, Muhammad Yunus uh, of Grameen Bank, of course, and the microfinance pioneer. We actually like to joke with Yunus that we scooped the Nobel Prize Committee <laughs> by two years. Um, Amidar of Idealist.org, and Bill Strickland of Manchester Bidwell Corporation. And tonight, we're honored and thrilled to present this award to Vanessa Kirsch, the president and founder of New Profit, Inc. Now, in order to introduce Vanessa properly and to present the award, and, and more importantly, to engage in a dialogue with Vanessa and to invite you into that dialogue, I'd like to call on my colleague, Professor Greg Dees. Now, I should probably mention, Greg is doing this, and we're thrilled to have him join us. He's literally just off the plane. He was uh, keynoting at a conference on social entrepreneurship in Beijing over the weekend and was in Dubai last week to... Uh, lead the Global Agenda Council on Social Innovation. So Greg, I don't know if you got any sleep at all today from coming to the plane. <laughs> so I got a little, bit. A, little, a little bit. bit on the plane. So I also want to thank you for doing this and want you to join me in please welcoming Greg and also welcoming Vanessa tonight. Well, I certainly wouldn't have missed this. And when we first got the date settled uh, for Vanessa's uh, event here, um, I changed my plans in uh, Beijing, actually, and uh, scheduled an earlier flight home, though it meant getting up at 4 a.m. Oh. Beijing time oh, uh, to get here, uh, because <laughs> I wouldn't miss it. I've known oh. Vanessa for, for several years uh, and uh, have uh, learned a lot from all of my encounters with Vanessa, and I knew I'd learn a lot uh, if I spent any time with her tonight. And I also uh, know that if anybody deserves this award, Vanessa deserves it. It's uh, She's been tireless in advancing the field of social entrepreneurship. Um, and she's uh, also somebody, one of the few people, I think, who's seen this field from 
uh, multiple perspectives. So Vanessa has been a social entrepreneur, having launched Public Allies and run that organization for a number of years. She's also funded social entrepreneurs in very innovative ways through New Profit, uh, New Profit Inc. And she's put social entrepreneurship on the public agenda here in the United States um, and done that through her, through her work in a number of different ways, uh, through the gathering of leaders that New Profit uh, Inc. hosts, which brings together a lot of thought leaders in and around this field, as well as people who weren't in the field before, but she brings them into the field through that gathering of leaders, um, and also through an effort that was called America Forward, uh, that was launched out of the gathering of leaders that put uh, the idea of social entrepreneurship and social innovation on the political agenda during the primary campaign uh, for, for the, 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 the last set of presidential elections. So it was actually during the primary campaign that the, the desire was to get this on every presidential candidate's uh, mm -hmm. uh, agenda. 14 uh, of them, we yeah. met with all of them. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> So it's, and, and during the course of this, uh, it, it's been fascinating to watch. So over the time that I've known Vanessa, she's been able to draw into this field of social entrepreneurship people like uh, Clayton Christensen, who was a former colleague of mine when I was uh, at Harvard Business School. Clay, actually he was a PhD student when I was at Harvard Business School. But Clay's <laughs> become quite famous for his work on disruptive innovation. Um, and and she, Vanessa got intrigued about applying that concept here in the social sector um, and persuaded Clay to bring his ideas into the social sector, uh, resulted in a nice Harvard Business Review article, but he's now also written a couple books, uh, one on uh, disrupting class, I guess, which is yeah. about education, and, and one on healthcare, which is it prescribing healthcare, so yeah. something like that, prescribing health yeah. or something. He's got. He's yeah. now done work in both education and healthcare, uh, in, in large part uh, as a result of interacting uh, w with Vanessa. She's uh, reached out to another of uh, a Harvard Business School colleague, Bob Kaplan, who's done work on the Balanced Scorecard. Bob had dabbled a little bit uh, with nonprofits before that, but Vanessa pulled him into this, got him involved with New Profit Inc., developing Balanced Scorecards for the groups in the New Profit portfolio, and Bob has. Uh, has really become uh, an advocate and, a, and an expert now in how to use the balanced scorecard in this setting, um, which I think is fantastic. He's a, a leading thinker in this, in this field. Um, other people like Jim Collins. I mean, Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, was, you know, was the hot business book of the year, and Vanessa um, can, persuaded him to come to this gathering of leaders. The gathering of leaders brings together a lot of the people you'd think of in the field of uh, social entrepreneurship and a lot of funders who have an interest in it. And then several other just stimulating, interesting folks. Uh, Vanessa always tries to get other people in the room who will stimulate our thinking. And, um, and so she brought Jim Collins in, forced him to sort of think about what would good great look like in this sector, which is a bit different from business. Uh, resulted in Jim Collins producing a little <coughs> slim little volume called Good to Great in the Social Sector. Um, and that came out of his efforts to try to, to grapple with the questions that came up when he had to present to this group. Um, um, and there are others, Stephen Goldsmith uh, and David Gergen, I want to mention those two folks at the Kennedy School at the time. Stephen is now uh, uh, deputy mayor in New York, but uh, he was at the Kennedy School uh, when, when Vanessa um, tapped, tapped into his expertise. He was a former mayor at Indianapolis, but he was at the Kennedy School running a program on innovations in American government. Um, and Vanessa persuaded him to start a, uh, what they call an executive session at the Kennedy School, where you bring together experts uh, and, a, and a topic. And this was, the topic was going to be civic, in a, civic entrepreneurship or civic innovation, yeah. one, one of those right. two. Yeah, civic entrepreneurship. And, and it, it resulted was, in social innovation. Yeah, it re <laughs> resulted in a book. So, so Stephen then gathered a group of uh, experts, and these experts would then meet uh, several times over a period of, of years, and they include some people at non-experts. I slipped under the radar, yeah. but I did get into the group, which was <laughs> fun. And we met uh, several times over the course of a year and a half, two years. And Stephen wrote a book uh, on social innovation, the power of social innovation, um, which which is uh, uh, really a, a very good book from the perspective of how government can work with social entrepreneurs. Um, as a result of as a result of that, and again stimulated by by Vanessa's work, 
David Gergen as well drawn into this, brought to the gathering of leaders, drawn in more and more deeply into social entrepreneurship as a result of this, um, and uh, wrote a, a, at that time early on a, a very a powerful essay in U.S. News about uh, social entrepreneurship, and of course he now he heads a program on social entrepreneurship at the Kennedy School. So her influence in this field uh, is widely felt. And in, in the United States, certainly there's nobody else, I think, who's had the kind of impact in this field. Um, and we are truly honored to, to present this award to, to Vanessa tonight. So I think before we start talking, I'd like to give her a, certainly a round of applause for a well-deserved award. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just to get us started in the, in the conversation, let's go, let's roll the tape all the way back to the beginning when you were just starting Public Allies. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. What, what led you to do that? Why, why did you get Public Allies started? And what did you learn from that experience? Yeah. Well, I'd love to I'll share that. I do want to just say it's so great to be here. And looking out, there are lots and lots of friends in the audience here. And um, it feels great to be coming back here because uh, one of our first sites of Public Allies was here in North Carolina. And um, we spent a lot of time here. And, Greg has been, for me, I don't think I'd be doing this work if it weren't for Greg and his work. When I first started a uh, new profit, I was uh, learning from him at Harvard Business School, not as a student, but just <laughs> uh, from a distance. Uh, and then he went off to Stanford and then ended up here. But everywhere, we're always following the great work that Greg does and that uh, this school does. So it is truly an honor to get this award and to just be with all of you. And I really hope that we can just have a discussion. Um, I have some questions for you all, so don't think you're off the hook. Um, but, um, but I'll start with telling a little of my story. I know there's some people here who maybe know more about uh, Public Allies and New Profit and others who've never even heard of any of them. So um, I'll just start by saying that I, uh, after I graduated from school, and this is sort of to demystify social entrepreneurship, I did not know what, that, what social entrepreneurship was. And um, I went to work for a presidential campaign, uh, the Dukakis campaign. Uh, and one of the best things about doing that was it was a permission slip to meet with anybody and talk to anybody about any, you know, pretty much any issue. And I really got a pulse of America, traveling um, the country as a young person right out of college, started in Iowa, Florida, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. But over the course of that, I really was struck by um, how impressive our young people are in this country. Whatever community you're in, you know, whether it's you know, college campuses, inner city communities, whatever it is, you, there's a, there are amazing young people. And yet, I was struck by the fact that there was not a lot for them to do. There weren't a lot of great jobs. Nobody was investing in our young people. There weren't a lot of leaders. And uh, so I went, I had gotten a job right after the Dukakis campaign working for a pollster, Peter Hart. And, uh, I went and said to him, you know, after that trip uh, across the country on the Dukakis campaign, I just feel I have to, I, I'm, I have a passion to do something for my age group, for young people, and I just can't think about anything else. And I think that's worth noting, because social entrepreneurs are people that they've just got something in their head, and they just can't do anything else. So I was obsessed and decided to start a small program in Washington, D.C. Um, I decided I had no idea how to do, go about doing this. I really no idea, and I never heard the word social entrepreneur in my life. Um, but I decided to just go door to door and recruit all the young people in DC that wanted a job. That was really mm -hmm. idealistic and really good idea. Mm -hmm. And I got hundreds of young people to show up at the mayor's office and say we all wanted jobs. And surprisingly, mm -hmm. there were no jobs. And so <laughs> then I was stuck with the problem of how to deal with all the expectations I'd raised and uh, decided to start a small urban peace corps started to raise some money. Uh, my first funder is sitting here in the room, Ed Sklut. Um, amazingly, he found us um, and gave us our first seed capital um, to start Public Allies. And uh, we started in a small, small program. Um, I started with a partner. And starting with a partner is always great. And then I'll just fast forward because there were just social entrepreneurship is about sort of, you, you really never know what path you're going to go on. And I, um, uh, I had a, a couple of amazing things happen that um, I think 
I always think that I have a, a guardian angel that works overtime for me. And it's largely because I know I'm on the right path. And I'm just doing the thing that's right. And people come out of the woodwork to help you. And so my first graduation speaker, I go to my old boss and I say, I need a graduation speaker that's going to be really inspiring. He goes, well, let me look through my Rolodex. And he goes through his Rolodex and says, I got the woman for you. She's the governor's wife of Arkansas, the wife of the governor of Arkansas. And I'm like, what? These kids are not going to hear her. Who is she? I, that's, that's not going to work at all. But he said, well, I can't think of anybody else. So I said, fine, OK. So lo and behold, it was Hillary Clinton. And <laughs> so she did our first graduation speech to the 18 kids and the 300 parents, 300 grandparents, parents, a whole audience. She said, Vanessa, if all goes well, we're going to do this in the White House someday. I got a videotape of that. And, <laughs> um, and so literally two years later, there they are in the White House, and I send her the video, and it turns out that she said, well, I want to do some big national service program, and we'll do that same graduation at, in the Rose Garden. So sure enough, she held to her promise right from the day you know, they got into office. That April, she did our graduation in the White House. And she said, you all are doing a great thing. Now how fast can you scale it? And I said, scale? What is scale? And mm -hmm. I started thinking, what is scale? And what does that mean? And so they wanted us to help them create AmeriCorps, but it wasn't created yet. So they introduced us to an organization up in Boston that was doing very similar work. And I went up there, and that was City Year. And I met the, unfortunately, I did not meet the other founder. I met Michael Brown, if some of you know. Alan Casey and Michael Brown started it. Alan Casey's my husband. I, unfortunately, I met Michael Brown that, that day. Or otherwise, no, no. I'd be married much more quickly. But. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I ended up um, learning about that the other people were thinking about scale. And I started figuring out, well, what do, what do business people think? And how do they think about scale? And I went to my friend who was at Staples. And he was sca scaling Staples. And I said, well, how do you do it? And he said, well, we get growth capital. And then we get all these consultants writing business plans. And we do, you know, we do an IPO and all this stuff. And I said, that sounds good. OK, I want to do that in the nonprofit sector. So I started going to foundations saying, I want to do an IPO, and I just need some growth capital. And they were looking at me cross-eyed. What on earth was I talking about? And then I realized that it doesn't work that way right now, or it didn't in the nonprofit sector. So back to the story, and I'll, I'll, I'll end it here. But I just want to give you a little flavor of like the creation of a social entrepreneur, because I certainly wasn't one. But I go, the, the Clintons say, how fast can you scale? I say, well, I'm going to go open an office in Chicago as the first place. So I drive cross country, because I can't even afford a plane ticket. And I go and I meet all these community organizers. Ed and other people introduce me to the Midwest Academy and all these great people in Chicago. And I meet this great community organizer. And he says, I love this idea. This is so great. I'll go to your Wing Spread conference. I'll help you start this thing. And I'll join your board. So he joins my board. And it's Barack Obama, which is just amazing. Mm -hmm. um, of course, at the time, he was not even uh, a state senator. He was just a community organizer. And he said to me, I got good news and bad news for you. And the good news is I got the perfect person to run your Chicago office. The bad news is if she runs it, I have to resign from the board. And I said, who's that? He said, my wife. So I hired Michelle Obama. And she, became, she ran Public Allies Chicago and started the whole office for three years. We left our board. And there again is like examples of just random good luck because I was on a mission and I was clear that you know, sometimes I think it's about sort of your passion. And if you just do the right thing, good things happen to you. And so clearly, that's my path. And um, so public allies, we struggled and struggled and struggled. And to this day, public allies struggles at scaling. <coughs> and through that experience, I really learned how hard it is in the nonprofit sector to scale anything. And uh, uh, I might just say a word about that, and then I'll let you ask me another question. But um, one of the things that was so striking is that I, as I started studying the concepts of scale, I realized that there are only 144 nonprofits that have gotten to $50 million since 1970. So when I was looking to do this scaling, and the Clintons were saying, how fast, and could you do it faster? And they were actually, they said, we, if public allies could do 10 to 20,000, and city year could do 10 to 20,000, we can do 50,000. That all sounded great until I tried to execute it, and I tried to find the capital and all the challenges that I faced in trying to actually grow rapidly. Um, so I started becoming aware of the challenges of truly scaling nonprofits. But undaunted, 
uh, it, was, it was more of a, uh, you, you experience the challenge and you say, I'm going to do something about this problem. Yeah, so, so what did you do about it? <laughs> <laughs> Leading question here, but uh, yeah. um, I mean, in, in so, basically yeah. what happened was that after 10 years of sort of building public allies um, and also caring to marry my husband, who was scaling city air, we decided first to take a year and travel around the world, which was encouraged by people like Ed and others. And in that travel, we interviewed 350 social entrepreneurs and civic leaders around the world. And that was a, another passport to just visit with people and listen. And, and, and listening campaigns are a big part of starting anything. Is you want to you want to act with total passion and determination, so you have to do a lot of listening. And so, on that trip, I was aware of the fact that I was, for example, in a village in Vietnam, and there was this woman doing this amazing, saving people's lives. And in the village right next door, kids were dying. She had created this nutrition program. <coughs> Both villages had Coca-Cola, and I began to wonder, what is it about the private sector that gets Coca-Cola down the Mekong Delta to places that don't even have electricity? And why can't we take a nutri you know, nutrition program that doesn't even cost any money and spread it rapidly? And so we just, it just became more and more apparent to me how hard it is. And it shouldn't be that hard. And when you're away from your country, and I know you probably just experienced this being in China, but when you go abroad, you start to see things about your country you don't even appreciate because you've been there. And some of the things I came to appreciate about America is, one, how entrepreneurial we are. We have a system of entrepreneurship in the for-profit sector that takes good ideas to scale. If you are, want to start an idea, and my father uh, is an inventor. He's a physicist at MIT, and he invents things. And some things are good, and some things weren't so good. But we always had venture capitalists in the kitchen wanting to know what his next invention was. And so even if you're, you know, you could really truly invent things in your garage and take them to scale. There's, there's a network of angel investors, venture capitalists. Then there's all sorts of mezzanine and private equity funds and IPO abilities and opportunities. There are consulting firms and business schools and accounting firms that all get the idea of taking things to scale. Then you take the nonprofit sector and you say, wow, we don't have that yet, but we're building it. And I started imagining what if we created that kind of system for the nonprofit sector. Not that it didn't exist, not that foundations weren't doing it, but in general, foundations tended to give on an annual basis. And their average grant was $40,000. You can never scale anything. You know, I just got to the point where I couldn't ever ask for more. You know, there were enough people, enough days, enough hours to, to ask. Um, and so you need a certain set of foundations that are willing to invest in the long haul, so willing to go three to seven years. You need foundations that are not only uh, investing, but are aligned with your strategic objectives. So they're not investing in programs, but they're investing in your enterprise wholesale. They're investing in leadership teams and people, not just proposals that are written on paper. So being an entrepreneur, I decided to start a foundation. My mother said, Vanessa, you don't know anything about running a foundation or a venture capital fund. I said, that's OK. It's never stopped me. So um, I started New Profit uh, as a venture capital fund for the nonprofit sector. Um, with the aim of giving long-term grants, generally, initially a million dollar, now we're doing million to five million dollar grants. Um, we do it over a period of time. We invest, we take seats on the boards of the organizations. We're based at a company called Monitor, which is a management consulting firm. So Monitor does a million dollars of consulting for every one of the nonprofits we invest in. Um, and they've rotated 300 of their consultants through new profits. So um, we take people on six-month stints, half-time, to work at New Profit. Um, and uh, it's really working. Uh, we've made 24 investments. We've, we've raised over $150 million. Um, and it's, the results are extraordinary. I mean, Teach for America, we invested in seven, eight years ago. Um, we're still invested. I mean, I think it's interesting to note that one because Wendy just spoke at our last board meeting, and I said, Wendy, your, your organization's now raising $110 million a year. What do you need our million or two million? And she said, it's not actually your money I need. It's the intellectual capital. It's the knowledge. It's being part of the community. And so 
what we are is a foundation that provides both financial value and the additional value that organizations need to scale. So how did you convince Monitor to be a partner? Why, why would they partner with Well, it was interesting. Like I knew that we needed somebody like that. I went to uh, Bain, McKinsey, BCG, and Monitor and made them all a proposition and got really great responses from each one of them. And to, to this day now, each one of them is somehow associated to mm -hmm. something similar. But um, what I think Monitor particularly saw is, one, that young people today don't want to live a life. Uh, in one of our focus groups, we used to ask, you know, do a pie chart and say, how much time do you spend in your community, you know, on social issues? How many time do you spend at work and how much time with family? And in this day and age, people want to spend their time. So it's not like three separate pieces of pie. They want an integrated life. And so what we offered to monitor was, we're not saying do it 10 years from now. We're saying it, do it now. Go to business, but do some nonprofit work and integrate it in. And that was a really appealing proposition. Uh, and I think we were able to recruit more people to monitor because of that offering, because they understood the whole human and how people want to be. Also, um, they had been giving pro bono assistance to a lot of different things and doing little bits and pieces, and it didn't add up. And now today, I don't think we'll ever be thrown out of the company, uh, although I used to think we would be, because they offered us free office space and, and, and as much consulting as we needed. Well, we're now a 50-person staff. So we're the biggest group company within the global headquarters. And it's all still free. And they never thought we were going to scale as fast as we've scaled. So they're up to $50 million of pro bono resources to us. But we're so integrated into the firm that they, they couldn't peel us out if they tried now. Because <laughs> 300 employees have gone through it. And senior partners, I, I always go after the most senior partners to make sure they're on the case. So we figured out a way to be really mutually you know, tied together. Well, and you've, you've raised a lot of money over time, but I remember yeah. early, early on, it wasn't so yeah, easy. Yeah, the, the, the chart would look like very, very flat mm. and then spiked about two years ago. Yeah, so, so um, what, what's the secret of getting people to invest in this sort of thing? And, and what were the challenges? Well, I can tell you the challenges. Yeah, I mean, talk about uh, the challenges and then... Being you know. a typical entrepreneur, I, I knew that we needed to convince people um, they needed to feel something real. And so... We, uh, so I gave out my first $4 million before I had it, uh, which presented problems down the line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think our board is only about four years ago did they finally pay off that $4 million that I gave out that I didn't have. Mm -hmm. um, but that is the nature of it is that I, was, I thought, wouldn't, if you were an investor, wouldn't you want you know, a consulting firm like Monitor, experienced social entrepreneurs, in, you know, helping to invest your money? Well, not so much. Um, <laughs> mm. I constantly was struck by how philanthropy is an interesting business. I'm sure some of you are studying it, but it's, um, it's not a uh, outcomes oriented. People don't get up in the morning and say, geez, I want better impact with my dollars. It's an experiential thing, and it's an emotional thing. And so um, I would go and sell and say, wouldn't you like to use your dollars more effectively? And I can leverage your dollars. And they'd be like, thank you, that's really interesting. And then they'd never call me back. <laughs> and so I've done 1,800 pitches for money. Mm. I've gotten so many no's. But what's interesting is about two years ago, directly correlated to the downturn in the economy, we spiked. And we raised $85 million in one year. And that is a huge spike relative to what we usually raised. And I still to this day can't quite figure out what happened. But I think two or three things started to happen. One is we started to have a track record of results. And so people started saying, whoa, they're not just, this is not just a theory. And they started seeing the great people we had invested in and the outcomes that they had had, and they started getting excited. Also, it took a while. Like A lot of people I had pitched early on, just really it was such a new concept. But now they started saying, I'll take 10% of my portfolio and give it to you. And those that gave me 10% increased it. And you know, we started with donors. The minimum was 100000 we now have individual donors who are giving us $25 million. So they've gone from having, you know, taking a risk and maybe giving us 5 or 10% of their portfolio to giving us 70% of their portfolio. Because they're saying, why would I ever hire a staff? Because I could never hire a staff like your staff. 
And 100% um, of the overhead is covered by your board, so all my money's going to the nonprofit. So it was a slow process. The other thing is, is that in the downturn, people started saying, I really need to use my dollars most strategically. I can't afford to waste dollars. There are a lot of people who are struggling. Poverty is you know, the worst it's ever been, job rating. And we need to do as much as we can with as little. And so they started to say, new profit stretches my dollar. I see a better leveraged effect and impact. And so we're inversely related to the economy. So, so talk a little bit about how you address the challenges of scale with your portfolio companies. So how have you been able to effectively address those challenges? Well, I mean, the issue of scale still is, you know, we haven't solved it. Okay. <laughs> I can tell you. The news story in the headline is not, you know, we've solved the scaling problem, but I can say that, you know, um, one quarter of our portfolio has already gotten to or is about to get to the $50 million mark. So you are, st we are starting to create these mid-cap organizations if you compare it to the for-profit sector. And so we're able to take an organization from one to five million to 50 million in five to seven years. And that is pretty historic, actually. It doesn't maybe sound that historic compared to the for-profit sector, but the nonprofit sector, it's pretty amazing. And one of the greatest, I think that the, you know, the three parts to the scaling question, but one of them is just merely knowing what the path is and knowing that you have a set of analogs and people who've done it before <coughs> you so you can take all the best practices. And so the other day, we had all the development directors of the 24 organizations we've invested in together for two days. And we brought in Teach for America and Kevin Huffman to sort of walk them through how Teach for America did it. And every one of those organizations in the room is going to do it, you know, 10 times faster than Teach for America did because they just get all the benefits of the best. So we're constantly just taking the best practices and driving them through all, all the organizations. So just that mere access to knowledge is critical. When I was doing public allies, I felt like I was on a desert. It was like, how do you scale? How do I hire? What, what are your financial structures? How do you evaluate? I mean, just, I, I just, anybody I could even suck information out of, it was just every day I was trying to get information. So giving the entrepreneurs and the leadership teams the access to the knowledge is probably the most important thing. Secondly, I think we've, thanks to your great work and Kathy, yours and others, it's like we've gotten so much smarter about options around scale. Not only do you just replicate your model but you can think about spreading it. You can think about action tanking, as we call it, where you create a demonstration and then you create public policy to use that demonstration to create a marketplace in, the, in government. Um, you have models like working today that have become totally revenue sustainable without any philanthropic needs. So you really have like all these different models of scaling and people are, from the get-go, when they come to apply for us for a million dollars, They've already started thinking about what, which option and why, which is so much, it, the field has advanced so much since. And then more importantly, in my view, the number of fi grants over $5 million has quadrupled in the past 10 years. So you're starting to see very slowly, that's not huge news because it was only 147 to begin with, but we're starting to see people giving bigger grants so they're getting the general, not all people, this is a very small subsector, but we're starting to see uh, a growth of the growth capital market. So you're going to get more and more private equity type funding in the nonprofit sector, and hopefully uh, we'll see even more IPO type activity with the advent of organizations like Sea Change Capital Partners and NFF Capital Funds, which are basically sort of creating syndicated uh, going public efforts. That might be, I know for some this might be totally new concept to you and others you've heard about it, but I really do see the nonprofit sector as getting rapidly learning from the business sector and, and, and it's much easier to be an entrepreneur and starting something and scaling it in this day and age. Yeah. And for those who haven't, haven't heard of NFF, Nonprofit yeah. Finance Fund, it's, yeah. it's the parent company to you want to get on and yeah, Google, Google all these it. are really great some, places to Google and understand. Yeah, they're doing some very interesting things. So the, one of the things that you mentioned there was about affecting policy and government. Yeah. I remember a few years back, uh, one of the gathering elite gatherings of leaders. Yeah. 
Oh, good. Sorry, I'm glad there's it's a your cricket. Phone and not it's mine. me. It's it's yeah. It's and a, it must be somebody you know. Oh uh, yes, <laughs> this is yeah. So I am wondering if you made it back from that, Beijing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, okay. I'll fill them in on my Beijing well, I was stories. It was a donor. My Beijing. Calling, yeah, no one. What are you is calling? Unfortunately, <laughs> it's not a donor with that ringtone. That that will. Uh, but I will. I will deal with that one later. Sorry, folks. My apologies. Um, just Sometimes sure when you're just off the plane, you forget to turn <laughs> off your phone before doing an interview. Um, so, <laughs> so um, back to the interview. You, but I remember this gathering of leaders uh, where David Gergen was there, and we started talking about government and the role of government and the relationship between government and scaling of social innovation, social impact. Um, talk a little bit about that, because after that, there seemed to be a lot more attention. And you certainly started paying a lot more attention the government, and government's yeah. role in this, and, yeah. and after that's you know when America Forward got started, mm -hmm. and this yeah. the whole attention of getting social entrepreneurship on the government agenda. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean it's been an interesting evolution because I have to say we all started um, mostly because we felt like government wasn't succeeding, and we were going to do sort of the workaround strategy and show that you could be it could be done better, whatever it was, but. In general, we were feeling the failures of government, and you know, I wouldn't say it's entirely generational, but we all grew up with this sense that, you know, government was too big, and that we were going to have to cut government back, and and so the Reagan era was sort of like, you know, trying to take you know government away, and so we kind of, I think a lot of the social entrepreneurs said, well, okay, if government's not the answer and business not the answer, we've got to do these, build these nonprofits, and we've got to scale them, and we have to be the solution. And then as we got to a certain level, we realized, oh my gosh, we could never, I mean, even Teach for America, which is running at a $110 million annual budget, is nowhere, you know, it's, it's a couple thousand teachers. I mean, these were nowhere near scale. And so David said to us, you all are missing out. You social entrepreneurs are sort of all business and all about alternatives to government, but the bottom line is government has you know, way more money than you'll ever have. For example, the Gates Foundation, if you take all the money the Gates Foundation gave, a, gave away in education last year, it's, you know, you'd spend half of that in North Carolina alone on education. So you know, we're just, you know, the amount of money that's out there in government, we spend $300 billion in the nonprofit sector collectively, and you look at the the annual budgets, federal budgets, and state budgets, et cetera. So we started realizing that if we don't start thinking about a better collaboration between social entrepreneurs and government, um, we're never going to make kind of progress. But as we started talking about what was the problems, I mean, it, there, there were so significant. I mean, the, the fundamental one was who determines public will. So for example, a nonprofit comes in and says, well, we want to work in these five schools. Well. The mayor wants to work in these six schools because he's getting reelected and he wants to work in this neighborhood. And you have these dilemmas of how, who decides where, because the entrepreneur wants to run the best organization and is funded by a bunch of donors who want it to be here and there. And so there's a lot of negotiation and relationships that have to happen. As we, as a community of social entrepreneurs sat down, we said there's no way we're ever going to make this significant impact if we don't start working more effectively. And we laid out all the challenges, and then we started saying, well, where should we work? And we debated whether we were going to focus as a community on cities, because really that's where sort of the rubber hits the road, or federally. And we only chose federally because it was the first open election in 50 years where there hadn't been an incumbent. And so new ideas, you really could bring up new ideas. It wasn't just bashing the whatever party that wasn't in office. It was going to be really an ideas opportunity. And so we decided. <laughs> to do a very bold thing and basically um, raise a lot of money. Because to do this, it takes significant kind of resources. I mean, not a lot. I mean, a couple million dollars. But basically to meet with all the presidential candidates and make sure that it was something that they appreciated, that social entrepreneurship was a key part of American society and that we had to create a better environment. And so we put together a three-prong agenda. One was to create a White House Office of Social Innovation. Two was to create a a fund or a set of funds in cabinet positions that would allocate money to social entrepreneurs. And three was to scale national service because 
talent, a lot of our organizations, entrepreneurial organizations, use national service as a mechanism to scale. Well, the end uh, result was that uh, we got McCain, Clinton, and Obama to agree to all of them. And then when Obama got into office, we had already worked with Senator Kennedy and Senator Hatch on a bill so that we handed him a bill with, worth noting, uh, 79 senators signed on to this bill, which I don't think will ever happen in history mm -hmm. again right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but we had already, prior to the, even the um, Obamas being elected, set that up, which was a wise choice because it was truly nonpartisan. And so it was one of the first things that went through in the first 100 days to create the Social Innovation Fund, the White House office, and scale national service. So in some ways, we feel incredibly excited about the progress we've made. In other ways, we feel, um, and you know, we New Profit are now taking in federal dollars, and uh, it is daunting and challenging. And you know, there's lots of work to be done to continue to improve how that interface works. But um, we, do, we are getting over a billion dollars now to social entrepreneurs that otherwise wasn't going to go in that direction. So it hasn't all been allocated yet, and it's probably going to be wiped out of future budgets. But uh, we're on the path. I, I do want to say that I think this moment in history is a really important one. You know, in the progressive era, was the first big takeoff of social enterprise with uh, you know, the hull houses and settlement houses and the creation of what exists today, the largest nonprofits today, all started within a 10 to 20 week period, uh, year period in the progressive era. Then we went into sort of the uh, great society time when actually most of the innovation happened in government as opposed to through nonprofits. And you got programs like Head Start, Medicaid, Medicare, all those kind of things. But sort of the social entrepreneurs were largely in government. And this new era is really um, an exciting one, but one that's just on the brink. I mean, we, this could be wiped out in the next year, two years, five years. Um, you know, we're really at the, we're not at the uh, very, I mean, we're at the very, very, very beginning of this whole movement, but um, is really a movement in which we try to get government to understand that it is an investor in what works in communities. So, you know, initially, nonprofits were largely in the progressive era, volunteer-driven organizations. Um, then, you know, we had the head starts where the foundations would seed good ideas and then government would run the programs. I think what we're arguing is that the time is now for nonprofits to run the programs, for social entrepreneurs to be in the position to run the thing, but for government to be funders. And for government to understand that its role is not to run programs, but to fund good community leaders to run programs. And that's, that's where we're aiming at, um, and we're nowhere near there. But I will say that the Republicans love that message too, so I think we can make this bipartisan, and we can really carry it through whatever administration you know, happens in the next two, five years. Great. I'm going to ask one really brief final question, yeah. then we're going to open it up to the audience. So the brief, it, this could be a big question, yeah, but well, I'm gonna, yeah. we'll, we'll try to keep it short so that we can get some yeah. questions in. Just final reflections on the future of the sector, just some thoughts about where, where this is headed. I guess I'll just say, and we can talk about it more if people are interested, but that I think uh, we're getting organizations to some level of scale, but we have a long way to go. Probably the biggest challenges we face are three. One is we've got to really work on the measurement subject. and it, you know, we, it comes up, but I think we're in a really great opportunity because with technology, our organizations are able to get real-time data and also use their data against a set of counterfactual data that are big data sets. So the private sector has led for years, uh, been able to do this by getting, you know, Capital One and other companies have started because they've gotten access to huge data sets. We in the nonprofit sector are just starting, and you see College Summit is working with Deloitte on a college access clearinghouse of all college going rates so that College Summit can compare their rate against the national average. You're seeing a lot more movement in this space, but so I'd say data is, and, and measurement is critical. Number two is we need better collaborations between government, private sector, and nonprofits, and we need to create new kinds of social contracts among us, and we need to share the public value. It can't be the mayor deciding everything. It can't be the philanthropist deciding everything. It needs to be a true negotiation, and I'm very excited about the concept of social impact bonds 
as a way of driving those kind of collaborations. And so we can talk about what those are if you're interested. And lastly, talent. Um, and that's why I'm here today and why I think what you all are doing is so, so important. We need sort of these kind of mutant folks who can walk in all mm -hmm. sectors and who understand the importance of this kind of work. It's the front lines, it's exciting, and it's something that you know, people with private sector, nonprofit sector, government sector, we need to all come together and work you know, with those same tools. So, yeah, you mean mutant in the good sense yeah, of the, the term. Good mutants. Yeah, the good, good mutants. mutants, yeah, absolutely. All right, so we're gonna open it to the mutants that may have some questions. <laughs> Here, and we'll probably just gonna, we've got some mics out in the audience, so we're probably gonna uh, just alternate in case I can't see. We'll start over on this side, because I see a hand. Oh, I actually warmed to the, the title of Mutant, but I read a you lot do. of comics as a kid. Uh, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> um, what are is, you a mutant? Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. How uh, many people are here, I am actually just curious, how many people here have worked in at least two sectors? Good, we got a lot of mutants, excellent. All right. Um, and, and since you mentioned it before, wh what is a social impact bond? Uh-huh, great. I was kind of hoping Good. I'd get that in there. Um, basically, uh, in the UK, they just started piloting them. And the idea is for, uh, for nonprofits, in, the, in their case, they're working with rec recidivism, and the, non the philanthropists put up the money, and if, the nonprofit creates extra public value, the government pays back the philanthropists. And so it's an enabling way of where you're sort of building a social contract among a set of actors towards one specific outcome. So we're in the United States just starting to pilot. I mean, America Forward will be taking this on as their next big issue. So if Social Investment Fund was our first agenda, with the next presidential cycle, we'll be looking at social impact bonds, in part because there is no new money. And there will be no new money allocated. There's no new budget money. So any new innovations will be hard to get funded. But there is money that could be used more efficiently and effectively. So we're going to different cabinet members right now and saying, look, if you have a, you know, your lowest performing grants that you're giving out to nonprofits or government, we'd like to create a competitive environment and say, we'll give you the results you want or you don't have to pay us back. And that's pretty appealing across the boards. It's a very efficient use of government dollars. And it means that the philanthropists are taking on the risk, and the government's only paying for what the outcomes they want. Um, actually, the, the way it's structured in the UK, the, the investors, the philanthropists, mm -hmm. can make a return on that investment. Yeah. The return goes up depending on the performance of the nonprofits non that are underlying it. So you can actually get a, a, a really decent return um, if, if, the, if you pick good nonprofits that perform w above the benchmark. Uh, well above the benchmark. I think this is the total future, um, and that every issue, you know, it's not for everything. I mean, some where you need, you have to have a certain level of performance, and I mean, this right. is where it's 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 sort of snapped new profits work into very clear. We have a clear idea of what we need to aim at because we need to get our organizations to the point where they could take on, and and take on a bond money, and uh, not all of them actually, most of them aren't ready yet. Uh, but at least they know what they're aiming at now. Hi, thank you so much for coming here and speaking yeah. with us today at Fuqua. Um, I have a question about the types of organizations that you fund at New Profit and what kinds of activities they implement with yeah. that money. Great. Um, first of all, I'll say that I'm so passionate about social entrepreneurs that really we're, we, we started and said, if you're, so, if you're innovating in any field, we're interested. And um, I think that's important because so many foundations start with guidelines. Like, we have the solution. If education, we're interested in education, but we're only interested in this approach to education or this approach to youth development or this approach to environment. And it means that the entrepreneurs might have a more innovative approach, but the guidelines have been set 10 years ago and you can't. So we always tried to be sort of agnostic on issue. Now, I will say that over time, we've sort of tried to create an umbrella title, which is social mobility. We're basically interested in any innovations in social mobility. Now, you can use social mobility as nicely broad. And I fight with my board who always wants me to get more focused, and I say, yes, I believe in focus, but not on that issue, because I really want, who knows? I mean, we have somebody, we have a board meeting this week, and we have a, a, a great 
veteran who's come back from the Iraqi war, who's helping to mobilize and get all of our Iraqi veterans involved in service. And um, it's called Mission Continues. Now, that wouldn't, you know, if I'd focused on education or something, we wouldn't be able to invest in that. So we are agnostic on issue. The organizations tend to focus, we, we do have sort of buckets and a lot of organizations in education reform. And I don't know if anybody's been tracking the news today, but those of you who know Michelle Ree, or of Michelle Ree, she just launched a new nonprofit today and is on the cover of Newsweek, which we're pretty excited about seeing because she was one of our, in our portfolio with Teach for America, then she started the New Teacher Project, went on to be this um, chancellor of schools and is now coming back to the nonprofit sector. So um, we have a lot in education reform. That's just a hot space. Uh, but uh, increasingly, there's a lot around jobs and poverty, because that is a topic of urgent need. My husband had just finished an unsuccessful run for a Senate um, in Massachusetts, and he and I traveled across the state and really talked to people. And I mean, again, along those permission slip, you know, just our country is just so hurting right now, and people are so struggling, and. Uh, we need to figure out some real innovations around how to get people jobs fast, especially young people, because they're the generation that's going to be left behind. So New Profit's really interested in innovations in that. And then we're doing um, health issues and uh, music. Yeah. Um, hi. I don't, I don't know if you're... You're hitting with a big voice. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just interested in terms of, you spoke of it a few times this evening, in terms of returns. Yeah. You know, and the measurement of returns, yeah. I guess. I mean, that yeah. seems like a pretty interesting and complicated topic. Uh, yeah. Especially we need as it relates for to the recording, Tim, if you want to hear it for recording. Okay. Yeah. We, 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 do it for, uh, yeah. we do want to hear it for Yeah. We do want to hear it for recording. Yes. Yeah, so, just to repeat, I'm interested in just the terms of measurement of returns yeah. in the in nonprofit and social sector. It seems like a, a fairly complicated issue to tackle. Um, just kind of your thoughts yeah. with, with that. Well, um, I have a lot of thoughts on that subject. I think probably some of you here in the room do as well. But I, I, I'll start with saying we have to think about to what end. Um, I spent a lot of time at Public Allies measuring a lot of things that really didn't help me run my organization, and it didn't actually raise me any more money. And so I'm interested myself in helping our organizations um, do measurement towards raising more capital or helping them run the organization better. And so therefore, um, we, are, we help the organizations come to a strategy. We usually spend a lot of time helping them really get clear on what they're best in class at. Because as a nonprofit, you start to think you're best in class at a lot of things. And you really don't realize you know, you're uniquely good at one or two things. And so we try to get them to really focus on that. And then to create a long-term plan of how they're going to scale what they're best in class at. And then measure their performance against that. And find a set of donors that are interested in that activity, um, as opposed to, oh yeah, they're funding this activity even though I like doing this other thing. So um, what we do is we do use the balanced scorecard um, as really as a dashboard. We don't believe in just using one measure. We, use, we look at a set. And we're really interested in the financial health of the organization, but also the, how the customer or constituency feels about the impact of the organization. And then also the health of the organization. How is it, is it, a, is it a, got the capacity to truly scale? So we're looking at a dashboard of measures. And we're giving our investors a quarterly return so they're able to see the impact, the, their dollars invested, and what that's bought them. It is not, they do not get a financial return. But they are, we are moving money when organizations are, are not performing. We're reallocating our donors' money to the ones that are performing. And we're making sure to double down on what's working. Because so much in the nonprofit sector, foundations tend to say, oh, well, this isn't really working very well. We'll help you fund this. Instead of, this is working really well. Let me give you more money. And so I constantly, with Michelle Obama running my Chicago office and our North Carolina office and our Delaware office, we always got money for North Carolina and Delaware. And everybody said, well, Chicago's doing fine. Why would you need more money? Well, soon enough, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to retain Michelle because she's not motivated if she's not going to get more money for great performance. And so really getting the, the donors to understand that they have to double down on what works. And I have to say, one of my public allies board members walked in here. And 
uh, Tony Brown, who was on the board forever, and was why we were very helpful to our North Carolina public eye. So it's great to see you, Tony. Dying to catch up, but so I want to say one more thing. Actually, on the investor side, is that uh, I thought our investors wanted quarterly returns, and we do give them to them, but they don't really read them that often. They mm -hmm. want to know that we're doing it, but they're not necessarily interested in the deep details. And that's part of my learning curve of how you actually raise capital in this sector. They want the emotional experience, and they want to know that I'm taking care of it. But think about donors who give to Duke. They like to know Duke is running their money well, but they don't really care that much. And they love coming down for alumni you know, weekends. That's basically the way I think of my donors. I want to give them the alumni weekend, and I want to just assure them that it's being taken care of, but they don't actually want to know all the details. And it took like a few studies for us to figure out that the big packages of data that I was sending them were not getting read. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I kind of feel honored to be here because I'm a, uh, I started my own uh, nonprofit in North Carolina, and it's just been growing really, oh, really great. rapidly. What is it called? It's called Voices Together. Awesome. <laughs> and everybody's been trying to fit me into, I ah, know. And oh. I find myself here, and I'm going, oh my gosh, this is what my husband has been telling me. There's this whole world yeah. Good. <laughs> that I'm just starting to discover. So I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. I'm very excited well, about everything you're when, saying. <laughs> when somebody told me there was this conference on social entrepreneurs when I first started Public Allies, I, I was like, really? Like you can go to a meeting and meet all these people and think like yeah. this? And honestly, I went to one and I was, it was like, I was, that was the rest of my life. Yeah. So yeah. you might never <laughs> go back. <laughs> this is very That's exciting. Great. I was wondering if you have, when you do um, invite organizations yeah. um, that you support, um, is there a size? Is there? Are you looking for an organization that's looking to yeah. scale a certain? Well, um, um, there is now a somewhat functional capital market, and uh, Draper Richardson, Ashoka, and Echoing Green fund early stage organizations. They give sort of the first 60,000, 100, they go, their, their gifts are between 60 and um, 200,000 and they're for earlier stage organizations. We get a lot of our deal flow, about 70% of our deal flow comes from those three entities alone. Um, they fund many, many deals and they take a lot, a lot of risk. And then we take, we look at organizations that are roughly 500 to a million dollars and we take them to the 50 million dollar mark. And uh, there are about, I'd say about 40 venture philanthropy fund like things like us. Um, I'll mention a few just so people know, Robin Hood, Venture Philanthropy Partners, Ed's on the board of VPP. Um, there's uh, Strategic Grant Partners, Social Venture Partners, um, and on our website and other places, you can see the sort of capital market and that group of funders. And then, happily, there's this new group of funders, um, Sea Change Capital Partners, which is a bunch of Goldman Sachs partners have come together to create a social investment banking approach. Um, and uh, NFF Capital Partners is doing similar work. And now there's the Growth Philanthropy Network, which is also starting to do that. So you're starting to see sort of a whole pipeline. Very early days, but um, what's exciting about the federal legislation is that um, it's encouraging more behavior like this. So the social, in order to, New Profit had to apply to become a social investment fund grantee. And so now we, we take in federal money and give it away for the government. And um, there are now 11 of us doing that, and the goal of it is to help grow the sector. One final question. Right up here. You mentioned the emergence of IPOs in the social mm -hmm. enterprise space. Um, can you walk us through maybe an example and how it may be different for the social space versus yeah. the public space? Um, well, first, uh, of course, it's very different. <laughs> but some of the similarities are um, something like Habitat for Humanity gets $400 million from $25 gifts. So massive, I mean, it's just a 
it's a brand and you know the, the solicitation comes to you by mail or you volunteer at church or you do something, you make that $25 contribution. That is recurrable revenue. That is something that you can get. You've built a great brand and you can continue to get. Similarly, Teach for America has gotten to the point where it has such a good brand um, and a set of people who are invested at the local level. Like most of their big money now at Teach for America does not come from big donors. It comes from their city operations. So it's a city that says, I'll sponsor this teacher, that teacher, and they have many, many sponsors. So um, you've created this sort of citizen demand of a set of donors. That's one way to sort of IPO. Another uh, is an organization like Working Today, which is now called the Freelancers Union, if people know of it in New York, which has basically um, creates insurance for temp and contingency workers and its portable benefits. And it's now organized all these temp and contingency workers. And now it's got revenue because people just need their benefits and they keep paying for it. So we originally gave it philanthropic dollars, but now it's a $40 million fully sustainable not for profit because it's nonprofit, but it's sustainable revenue. And then the third way, which I think is um, probably the most controversial, but uh, you know, is sort of IPOing in government, where a lot of our organizations are starting to say, "Look, we'll basically government outsource to us, but pay us a fee for service." And so College Summit is saying two hundred dollars per kid, and we'll get your kids into college, and we'll take your college going rate up to eighty percent but you, government, have to pay for that. And so that's another form of IPOing. It's a little less consistent because you never know what policy is going to go or not go. All right, we'll give you the final word if you want to. Yeah, well, um, first, uh, it's just a pleasure to be here, and your questions are all so great. And I hope that um, you all can help me continue to build this movement because this is, uh, we're early. Again, I just sort of want to emphasize that early on in this process. and. I know I've been sitting, I've sat in audiences like you, and I hope that each of you think of some way that either you can help start a nonprofit or help fund a nonprofit or help build the movement in your community, in your neighborhood. And it's so exciting to see mayors and governors and city councils take on social innovation. And we were just talking about the fact that Beijing in China, they're calling, you know, in their newspaper that it's a social innovation. This is a movement, and everybody needs to be a part of it to make it happen. And, um, we can be the leaders in solving social problems with entrepreneurial expertise in blending the best of for-profit and non-profit. But it's going to need all of you to sort of step up and be a part in some way. So I hope you leave this feeling motivated to figure out some way to fit into this world at some point in your career and life. So right. thank you for having me. So join me in thanking Vanessa not just for her remarks, but for her contribution to this field, which has been just amazing. Thank you. I can hand it to you so you can. Oh, thank you. Uh, Great. You know, officially <laughs> Lovely. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.